it's a good point you're making then, just but before we thought we best hit record before we actually uh, get too deep into the com- conversation. But like the attribute side of things, you made a very solid point about nobody calls out any other attribute other than strength. Yeah, this coming from two guys who are probably more renowned for having, you know, being big and strong in the jiu-jitsu yeah. side of things. And what's even funny is we're not either even that big or that strong. It's just for some reason, jiu-jitsu seems to gravitate a lot of small, weak people. I'm going to get a lot of shit for that. I know. Coming, coming out of the gate, Scott. <laughs> what out there with a the dynamite stick straight away? <laughs> I'm going to uh, sit at the table with my cup of coffee and, like, there's a lot of weak, small guys in jiu-jitsu who convince me otherwise. <laughs> it's true though isn't it nobody's, really. nobody's ever arguing about oh mate you're so flexible like no. stop being so flexible when we go it's never been an issue being too flexible whereas like you say as soon as you do something and it's deemed as being strong or oh, using too much strength there using too much strength your weight's too much or you're too big for me yeah. like well you're smaller so you've got probably speed on your side. I'm not telling you to slow down. You fle- you're like, you're stupidly flexible. I'm not telling you to be less flexible. Why does my attribute that I've worked hard to develop, like, for some reason, supersede yours? Yeah, I mean, I think we both know the reality of the matter is, like, if you are being ridiculous with your strength and you just bear hugging somebody to the ground and it's not a fun role if it's like a training round role then you know maybe don't do that yeah uh, and you know you're not gonna th- there are certain elements to take away from the practical application of that strength on the mat like you're gonna learn how to use it and like yeah. if you really need to pin somebody down and hold them in a position that it matters you need to practice doing that because if you never get used to pinning somebody down and using your strength when you need to do it, you're not going to have had the practice of doing it. No. Um, but equally as well, I was having a uh, bit of a back and forth with Aaron Chatfield about this the other day on Instagram. He essentially put up a post saying, uh, you know, if something along the lines of, if you're using any of your physical attributes, whether that be strength or you're younger or um, you've got better endurance, the thing that you should be focusing on is not that and you should be focusing on pro- improving your skill. And while I 100% agree with that, like every single person doing jiu-jitsu should practice getting better at the skill, mm. there's an element of um, everybody's got a human body that's doing jiu-jitsu, so they've got to have an attribute that's better than somebody else at it. Yeah. And that's how you adapt your game to do the sport. Well, it's taken away the fact that being stronger or having certain physical attributes better than others is skill development in itself. It's taken that away from it and it's taken away the fact that this person can train, like weight train and whatnot, as well as be very good at grappling. Are you only good because you can, because you can, because you're stronger? No. Oh. They're good and they beat you because they are better than you. They might not have the skill set that you've got and the technical knowledge you've got, but at the end of the day, they're still better than you because they can beat you. Yeah, and it always proves to show, unless there's a massive disparity in physical attributes, the guy with the better skill set and the better knowledge is always going to win. Um, yeah. If you know, if, if we're completely taking the physical attributes out of jiu-jitsu, which is a combat sport at the end of the day, just go and play chess. Yeah. Like, you can both just have a battle of the brains on a desk where there's no physical attributes involved whatsoever. And I guarantee you won't hear anybody at the chess table saying, mate, just use a bit too much brain there. Will you, like, tone it down a little bit? Like, you're outsmarting me. You're not allowed to be more than five steps ahead of me. You need to, <laughs> you need to reel it in a little bit. To be fair, though, this is just my excuse for getting smashed off people that are better than me. I'll just... Uh, I'm not even that big. Like, I don't even... I, <laughs> I, I used to get it a lot more and probably when I was a mongy white and blue belt and using more strength than I probably should have been doing. Um, but but it's, 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 a, it's a process you go through. It's a learning process of how to use your strength and energy at the right times. Yeah. Like, I, I get it all the time still. Oh, there's no point rolling if you do twice the size of me. Like, fine then. Like, I won't roll with you. Yeah, but then the question is, have you actually ever rolled with me? 
Yeah. Because as soon as you roll with, you know, you are, you are a big guy and you're a strong guy, but typically you don't generally tend to play that. You know, no. I, th- I think more people are often surprised about your flexibility than anything else is the, mm. the comment that I probably hear most often. Yeah. So I'm happy he's to... really flexible for a big guy. Yeah, I'm happy to play, like, guard and more passive with, like, less experienced players. And if anything, develop my escapes. Yep. And if they want to take it up a notch, I'll happily oblige. So what <laughs> Sai's saying, actually, is if, the, you, if you're experiencing his ultra-flexibility game, then he, he thinks you're a bit shit and he's just like... <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm just speaking from my personal reflection. Size never tried to smash me, so obviously <laughs> I get the. Uh... Mate, we, we've we've had some wars. Though. <laughs> we have had some wars in the, on the mats. Uh, I'm only joking, mate. Why did you up? Um... I think last last time we rolled, I think you had the color ties on me, and we did like we had a bit of a Titanic moment, didn't we? That was nice. That yeah, it, was, <laughs> it was a bit it was a bit Rose and Jack on the on the, end of the shit, wasn't it? Just wanted to start going like. Start singing the what's the Celine Dion song? Um, I'm gonna pretend like I don't know it and go. I don't know what you're on about. <laughs> that, that was that was my ploy there to get to reel you yeah. into it. <laughs> it was very romantic, actually. I had you in a, a tie collar, and you just decided to brace your neck and stand up. Stand up, right? I thought, do you know what? I weigh more than his neck is going to be able to hold for more than twenty seconds, so I'm just going to hold up. <laughs> so you're walking around with like ninety kilos hanging off your neck. And then I think we both realised what was going on and had a bit of a laugh and just carried on then. <laughs> um, but I could, equally could have turned around to him and said, mate, you're using too much strength. Like, just crumple into a ball. You said that, didn't you? <laughs> I, thought I, was, I, thought, I thought it. Did I say it out loud? Yeah, sorry, mate. That is a pet peeve of mine, though. Like, using too much strength. It's like, all right, then. If that's the case, stop moving so much. And I won't have to use as much strength to stop you from trying to escape. Yeah, I mean, let's flip the argument on its head. So let's say you're, the, you know, you're smaller or you're weaker or you're older or whatever, whatever it is, and you know, you just get you're going into the gym, you're getting absolutely smashed by somebody who's literally only doing strength on you all the time. I can I see that. I, I understand with less experienced players. And and they're not like sort of uh, changing the level of strength and like what they they're not changing that level. They're staying at hundred all the time. Then yeah, the argument is there for oh, using too much strength. But for somebody who can scale their strength to match what they're receiving or to match their opponent's sort of level. It's, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be said, especially if someone's. I probably argue, purple belt and above, you should never complain about someone using too much strength, unless there's like a twenty year age difference. Yeah, I, I, probably a good comparison that like is is easy to think about is like if you went to if you were striking, let's say you were going to like a Thai boxing gym or something like that, and then every time you came in. Like this one guy is just chopping you with the heaviest leg kicks he can hit, and mm-hmm. then leg kick, leg kick, left hook, just all the time. That's that's what you get out of every single uh, training session with him. Like, a you're not learning anything except how to get leg kicks. You probably yeah. should take the opportunity to learn how to check better. Um, I mean, kind of the argument that I'm trying to get around with this is learn how to overcome the circumstances that you've been presented with. If mm. the person who's doing that to you is unwilling to change their game style. I get that it's not pleasant, um, but, you know, it's an opportunity for the person on the receiving end of it to learn as well, as long as it's not dangerous. Yeah. Um, Which is often lost upon a lot of people. Because it's crap being in that position. Yeah. And you don't want to, like, you don't want anything to do with it. But it's, it's, a lot of the time it's ego kicking in, not wanting to be at the bottom of the totem pole. But, if you're starting out somewhere new, you're going to be at the bottom and you're going to have to work your way up, especially in a combat-based, a combat skill-based sport where physical attributes are going to um, 
play a part in your development. Like, I'm not saying, like, asking people to tone it down shouldn't be taboo. Like, if someone's caning you and you're like, I didn't sign up for this, I'm here to work out and I'm here to improve, Yeah. then by all means, have the conversation and be like, look, I'm here to learn and get that across to them. But a lot of the time, like, a lot of the time it is men who have their egos bruised because they've either been beaten by somebody younger or beaten by somebody less experienced who's more athletic. I'd um, probably say that that's a double-sided coin as well, to be honest, because, like, you know, if you... You, know, you don't enjoy being on the receiving end of those sort of physical attributes. But let's say you, you know, like you, you're in a gym and me and you're in a gym. We're both a similar sort of size and we don't know each other. And, uh, you know, it's not that kind of like feeling out process. If you just go into an open mat or something like that, and let's say you're far physically superior, stronger than me. And there might, there might be a bit of an element in there of you being like, oh, I don't know what's going on with this guy. I'm going to put it on him. Mm. And, uh, you know, and that and that's that works both ways. So, like being on the receiving end of it as well and getting beat is a check to your ego. Yeah. But also, for some people who aren't like quite as disengaged with it and willing to have a bit more of a playful round, like they feel like they've got to win. Like that's that might be the reason that they put it on you. Um, yeah. So just have that conversation with him. So like, mate, you know, just, can we have a bit of a playful round and a bit more of a flow roll and try and break break that barrier before you even start the the round. Yeah. Like, the conversation isn't going to hurt. And, like I say, just, like I say, we're not, we're not here to essentially, like, knock each other down. We're here to develop. And if somebody, like, I know that if I see somebody who's similar size and similar skill level to me and they were around... Personally, I tend to feel out the first minute and see what intensity they're bringing and then slowly um, build it up. But if they're coming in 100%, I'm going to come back 110% and we're going to have a, a tough round. Yep. And that's the other thing is all about, you know, like you said, seeking out being the, the you know, bottom of the pack. Because, I mean, there's benefits to being the best in the gym. But if you're consistently the best in the gym all the time and you're not challenging your level maybe it's maybe it's time to start seeking out those tougher rounds whether that yeah. be with a bigger opponent or taking a step up in level against your opponents um you're going to find it very difficult to progress I'd, I'd almost make the argument as well that the smallest person in the room or the least experienced person in the room is going to have the fastest rate of development yeah it's like they're just going to get almost dragged up the skill level yeah like you it's like, kind of like the whole learning for osmosis. You're going to learn to defend quicker. You're going to learn through what's being applied to you as opposed to almost like, yeah, being the top of the totem pole and dishing out the beatings, you're sort of receiving them. You you, pro mm. you will progress mm. a lot faster. Be the hammer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's that cliche argument as well, isn't there? Like, you should learn jiu-jitsu off a small guy. Learn small guy techniques. Because the argument is that they've had more pressure time under tight positions and they figured out technically perfect. And I will tell you where it's annoying being with a small person. When they've got those spaghetti arms and you're doing some stand-up wrestling, like... You think you've got a tight gap in here where somebody with a normal size arm can't get They're in. They're going to find like a piece up. of spaghetti threading in underneath your arm. It's like, what the hell's going on here? The worst bit as well is like Guillotines. trying to hold down side control and you're sort of like, great, I've got a great position here now. <clears throat> and then that knee pops through the middle. You're sort of like, there's never a gap there. Yeah. How have they found this gap? No, like I say, but that just goes into the category of everybody having those physical attributes. And that's the beautiful thing about jiu-jitsu uh, and MMA, actually, as well. Regardless of whatever your body type is, you can make the sport work for you. You've just yes. got to pedal down your niche and use your attributes correctly, rather than trying to do it like, oh, I've seen, uh, here's a good example. Like, here's a good example of somebody who's got really long legs and is good at triangles. Um. Oh. Just Anderson Silva. 
Yeah, like you say, I'm and Silva, and you're like, I want to play that style, but you're a stocky person, you've got short legs, you might have to pick another path to go down. You know, that path might not work for you, but the beauty is there's going to be a style that suits you and can be effective. Yeah. And like I say, the whole thing with the um, bigger coach and smaller coach, you, you're going to, you've got to find somebody who has a similar sort of, I don't know, like the whole smaller coach thing and bigger coach, it's all style based. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, uh, maybe got uh, misunderstood on that. I wasn't necessarily saying you should learn off a smaller coach. I'm just saying it is one of those oh, the whole you, like, you hear a lot. Yeah. The, the best coach that you should learn from is the one that knows the technique inside and out and knows how to apply it to a student who's a big person or a small person who's got flexibility, who's not got flexibility and has a real true understanding of the technique, like the triangle. What, what are the mechanics that make this triangle work? Yeah. How is he going to do it? He's six foot four. And how is she going to do it? He's five foot two. How is he going to do it? That's hundred kilos. How is he going to do it? He's 65 kilos. Like what are the mechanical differences that need to happen to make that technique work for you? That's the coach that you want to look for. Yeah. And like who, who has like also their own style as well, I think is important. Someone who's not just trying to fit every box, like someone who's, who's good in what they do, yeah. as opposed to being like, oh, I've, I know 20 passes on this side, 20 passes on this side, I can do 20 submissions here, 20 submissions there. Just reading off a load of, different things where it's like that's great but do you know these things inside out like um, an example of this would be like Andre Galval when he's teaching or doing instructionals and things like that he'll say look this is how you teach it and this is how you teach it and how it looks technically but in a role or in the ADCC finals it's not going to look like this it's going to look like this and then have like different examples of success and fail it, failure in that point. Yeah, and that's good as well because like Galva is a good example because I, when, whenever you watch any of his instructionals, you can tell that it's all like pressure tested on the mats because he often gives yeah. a lot of examples like, right, the guy's going to do this or he's going to do this or like the most likely reaction you're going to get is he's going to turn this way or put his hand here or whatever and then mm -hmm. this is what you do to carry on from that so it's, it, you can tell it's very much like pressure tested yeah. um, and you look at you know he rolls uh, every day with his students on the mats he's still competitive still work like the I was going to say still a world class athlete probably still like right at the top of the tree in terms oh, of yeah. um, competitiveness and you know what, what better a teacher can you get with that gi no gi um, it's awesome. Don't all. But um, the other thing is as well, like with picking a um, a coach who's got a particular style, that doesn't necessarily mean that that coach is trying to churn out fifty students who have that style. Like no. you're each going to come up with your own unique takes on the position that are one either dictated by your physical attributes, or two, the the other thing that everybody's forgetting on this is like your personality type. And the way yeah. that how that translates over onto the way that you carry yourself on the mats, a really aggressive head rush like forward person is going to have a completely different style to somebody who's very laid back, and they're going to have two completely different ways on how they implement the techniques and even what techniques they choose to do. Like find a find a super introverted laid back guy who's doing blaster balls. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, like it just it all depends, and I think as well like having a coach who you get on with. Like, I think that's more, I think that's one of the more important factors. Um, it's like any, any walk of life that you're having coaching or somebody, you need to gel with them in yeah. order to be able to take in the information that you're giving them. If you either don't respect them or you can't kind of gel, you don't like the way that they are, like, you're just not going to learn as well from them. No. Um, because you're not as receptive to that information, and like that, that's one of them as well. Like there's, there's just a lot of factors that go into it, and I probably I would recommend that if someone is looking to try the sport, 
find every gym in the area and try a few sessions at every gym and see which one you enjoy the most. Yeah. It's like if you, you know, you're on the dating scene and don't propose to the first girl that you end up going out on a date with. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> good um, analogy. Yeah, good analogy. Yeah. For, so for all you military guys out there, um, <laughs> don't just pop the question the first time you get back off a of deployment. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but no, in all seriousness, though, like go go find gyms because, like, the, usually, like what we're talking about is the the gym will adopt that culture as well. So all the people yeah. in the gym will probably be of a similar mindset. Um, so not only are you clicking with the coach, you're clicking with all your training partners as well. Like we both know, you go to a certain gym, and there's always definitely an air in the gym of yeah. Right, the coach is a bit like this, so like it's obvious that all the training guys are a little bit like that as well and some places are a bit more jokey and it's a bit more like in your face uh, other places are super rigid and it's like bowing on the mats and all that sort of stuff which is fun and and the great thing is there's a place like that for everybody yeah like i say you've got to find what suits you because some people prefer it when they're more rigid some people prefer a more laid-back atmosphere yep. some people want that tense atmosphere and you've just got to find the one that suits you and there's, and there's, there's plenty of choice out now. It's not like ten year over ten years ago where I think in Manchester when I started, you had the choice of might have been just been two gyms. I think it was Moss Eye Ground and Pound and SBG Manchester were the ones that I found. The other thing is as well, like right, with um, kind of the time what we said as well. We spoke about this quite a lot before on the podcast. Just try and make sure that the place that you're going is not a bullshit academy, like yeah, um, Stephen Seagal style teaching. Where I don't, it's, I don't know because I'm because I've not been a beginner for so long. It might be hard for me to put myself in the shoes of somebody who's just starting and who doesn't know the difference between like this is bullshit te bullshit technique and this is legit technique. I don't think yeah. there's very many schools that are like that anymore, but I'm, I'm definitely sure there's got to be a couple out there. There will be a few, I reckon, but they're more and more getting caught out um, and and exposed, so to speak. Um, I don't think I've heard of one, though, no, recently. Well, obviously not recently because of everything that's happening, but prior to lockdown, I think I'd only heard of one, and that was somebody who'd self-promoted to, I think, Brown Belt, and it was just a big, like, scene all over the... All over the um, the underground, which I found quite funny. How did the you have to expand on that with a little bit gone? How did the self promote myself to brand out? Apparently, like I didn't look too much into it because, like, I try to stay away from the gossip and everything in there because it gets quite toxic. But how many YouTube videos do you have to watch to promote yourself to brand out? Oh, I think you've got to have dedicated at least five years of your time to, to watching YouTube videos. <laughs> And it's only three if you're watching the Grappers Academy. <laughs> well, I was going to say, and that's a perfect segue to just say, go and walk back and watch all our technique videos. And by the end of it, you'll have a blue belt. You'll be able to self-promote yourself to blue belt. Well, that's it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... Uh... <laughs> yeah, and, and actually, we are send uh, $500 our way. <laughs> well, that's it, yeah. The Grappers Academy University. It's um, better than the other um, self-promoting online universities <laughs> hey now he's coming out with dynamite <laughs> I, I i have actually rolled with a couple of those um no there's a, there's a couple that have um like one of the excuses i heard this was years ago i'm not gonna say what gym they're from because that's uh, just it's just too baity but I after the after I think I was a purple belt. They were a blue. Yeah, I was purple belt. And put it politely, I'd mauled them for the whole round. Um, and afterwards, they pulled me up and goes, "Oh, if they were striking a ball from that round, then they would have been different." Right. Sounds like he's going to tell you up. I I left the round shivering in my boots afterwards. But genuinely, they said if if there was striking involved, I'd have won that round. 
in my head, I was like, okay, I spent most of the round on top and in better position to strike from, but okay. Well, he might have had a point. I, I saw uh, Jacare get knocked out from um, on top from, from wherever it was underneath a couple of weeks ago. So True. Yeah. True. This might be a topic for a completely different podcast, but I really like striking and grappling. <laughs> I, yeah. I, love, I love training it. I think I think it's so important to train because you train with somebody who never factors in striking into grappling. I'm not saying this was you by any stretch of the imagination, but like you go with somebody and it kind of ties in with everything that we said about turtling up all the time and putting yeah. yourself in those crappy positions. You can more than like I just channel my inner Khabib when it's one of those rounds. <laughs> it, I'm just going to tie it your is. hand up, punch you. <laughs> Like hook, use your heel to hook the the back leg so the hips slightly turn out. Few side of the head, they start defending. Hammers to the side of the head, they start defending. I tap the body. Oh yeah, I've not done it for a while, but I, I yeah, I love I love doing it. One of my favourites is just like tying the arms up over the head, where like usually nothing can really happen in jujitsu, but you just open up the ribs. <laughs> There's a position you used to get in side control where it'd be similar similar to that where like it'd be like a back step thing and I'd end up in like top side control but they'd end up here yeah that, that one exactly and it'd just be clouting into the rib cage but, but nicely though if it's training depends who it is oh yeah 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 training yeah 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 yeah. like the way that I do it is just like taps like no harder than that oh but yeah yeah it's, like, it's literally just sort of like awareness awareness punches yeah um but I really like, like it. I think it's super valuable. I think people should do more of it. I, yeah. I would train it like that. Um, it is like a class that I want to introduce to Hive once we can sort of reopen and expand the timetable, hopefully. I remember watching Brock Lesnar uh, back in the day do it to a couple of people, like literally not trying to advance, sitting on top inside control, pinning their head to the floor and just smashing them in the face. Had no other intention of doing anything. The classic one for that for me was uh, Shane Carwin versus Brock Lesnar. Might have been that much. Like, Shane Carwin absolutely mullered him for the first round. And then second round, Lesnar came with his... Like, they just both had lunchbox-sized fists. And I don't know how either of them survived. That was like a, a bit of a baptism by fire, though, that one, wasn't it? Yeah. I remember the build-up for that match and they were saying, like, uh, I think Cowan's got bigger hands than Lesnar as well. They were saying he's the, he's the only person in the UFC who wears 5XL gloves. Yeah. And I think they still had to, like, cut something off the at the at the wrist, something to get them on. Insane. Absolutely insane. Scary. And he was and a full, he was full time the working as well. Overeem and uh, uh, Ken Velasquez. Yeah. Um, two like, technicians. I still remember the um, the Velasquez one. I think Velasquez ended up uppercutting him and he ended up going across the ring. Like, I'm not going to lie, I do miss those days of the UFC. Like, for some reason, it feel, it does feel very different, like, the past few years with the UFC events. For, like, Alistair Overeem was one of my saddest, like, <laughs> coming off the juice declines because yeah. I used to love Overeem in K1, like, back in the day. And then he was just terrifying. Like, and he, if, even in that match with Lesnar, he drops in with the knee to the body. Yeah. And it's just like that over him for me is like pinnacle of MMA. Like K1 uh, and Pride, over him, Chuck Liddell, Rampage. Arlovsky, Fedor, yeah. Rampage. It's like the golden age. <laughs> like, I'm debating now loading up the UFC app to watch a few of the old events. Like, yeah. I, and I used to, I used to love watching as well the um, the original Tough series. Yeah. Like I think maybe series one through ten, I really enjoyed. And after that, it just got very like watered down. It was probably when the UFC was experiencing its like biggest push, wasn't it? Early two thousands, Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz. Yeah. Yeah. That um, Ultimate Fighter one though. Like if anyone's not seen that, they need to go back and watch it. Uh, the one with. Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin in, as in the final. Yeah. Um, the first time we saw Chris Lieben, first time we saw Nate Diaz. Yeah. Um, I think there was quite a few first in that series, weren't there? 
yeah, a lot of big names came out of that and the, yeah. and the first couple of seasons. It's, it's amazing, oh, yeah. actually, when you look at the tough winners, how many of them now are actually still going and they've been knocking on the door for championships in the UFC. Well, like Bisping, didn't he, did he win the third series or did he just do well in it? Because was it Ross Pearson? Was is he Ross Pearson series five or three? Uh, I think Bisping was on the season with Shamrock and Ortiz. Yeah, that was series three. That one, I think. Yeah. And then I know Ross Pearson was um, the UK versus US, wasn't it? Dan Dan Hardy was on the same one as Bisping, and it was the, he was one. It was middleweights and light heavyweights. Yes, he was because that was Bisping was a light heavyweight, wasn't he? Yep. Because they didn't cut, did they? Because they, 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 um, no. it's like a 12 week long thing or whatever it is. You just see the weight that you're at. Yeah. So. And then the, who was the guy that ended up wanting to get a um, enema to try and lose weight? <laughs> Do you remember that series? <laughs> it was a proper prima donna. Yeah. And he was like, oh, I can make weight. I can make weight. If I get an edit, if I get a. What's, what are they called now? Colonic. That's the one. He wanted to get a colonic to try and lose like three to five kilos. Jesus Christ. How much has he got packed up there? <laughs> I do not know. But <laughs> on, I, I, I think I'm going to have to go back now and start watching from series one. Like, this has got me like... This has got, got a bit excited nostalgia. about the uh, colonic talk there. Oh, <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> okay, so here's, here's a question that might be a good one to round out on. Out of all... Like modern times, uh, MMA compares. Who would be your absolute nightmare matchup to fight against if you if you got a step in the cage with them? From what era? Anybody. Anybody. Today, all the way through to like, let's just go like early two thousands. That era that we're talking. Hmm. Like. Pride Shogun was scary. And Pride Wanderlei was scary as well. Like, I think I'd walk in the ring with genuine fear in my heart going against that them one of those two over anybody else. Like, I'd go in against John Jones and I know I'd get me out, I'd get handed to me. But there wouldn't be a genuine fear. But, like, Pride era... Shogun Hua and Pride Era, Wanderlei Silva, oh, they were something else. Yeah, I think I think as well if you're talking about Pride rules over UFC rules, like with the soccer kicks, it's a little bit more intimidating than the. Uh... Uh, there's that clip in there. Is it Shogun like soccer kicking someone in the rib cage just repeatedly? Like, yeah. oh, or by yourself then. I, it's got to be like pride rules and it's got to be I, would, I was going to say uh, perhaps one of those two but maybe even Overeem uh, or, or Crow Cop. Cop as well Overeem or Crow Cop for me I think yeah. I was, yeah, those two was it right leg surgery left leg cemetery yeah like I remember when he first come um, UFC and was it G Gabriel Gonzaga was like knocked him out with his own tool yeah <laughs> That was like people talk about yeah, I was talking about the other day with somebody, and they were saying like your yeah, overeams, um, even your fedor to a to a to a degree, um Arlovsky, uh Nogueira. Krokop, like Nogueira, like they lost like going from the ring to the cage, they lost that ability to corner somebody in to like just open up on them, whereas like it's easier to circle away in the cage than it is in a, in a ring. So it's probably, they've spent that much time in that arena that it, like, it wasn't like that, the octagon fear, it was genuinely not knowing how to manage the space in that arena. Yeah, a couple of things going on, isn't it? Like one, the ring is a bit smaller than the cage. Mm. The cage is actually big, like bigger than most cages that you would have ever been in, in like an amateur MMA gym. Yeah. Um, like I reckon you could easily fit for volume size two like if you just any any walk up gym that's lucky enough to have a cage as an amateur um, I reckon you could double the size of that for a UFC ring for a start and then it, the shape of it isn't it like you say and when you think about somebody like uh, Overeem who's gone through the K1 circuit 
yeah. loads of kickboxing, then comes into Pride, which again is in a ring. And then the other thing that you've got to factor as well is when he comes over to uh, the UFC is, you know, there was a noticeable change in his physique. Uh, <laughs> that's going to have a that's going to have an effect on his performance as well. Yeah, uh, I'm sure Crocop was in the same camp. I think Aloski as well, wasn't he? Yeah, but the Pride era, no testing, soccer kicking, like hundred thousand Japanese fans screaming era. Is, like, for me, that's like the pinnacle of MMA. Yeah, 100%. something a little bit more special about it than the U than the UFC. Even though the UFC has probably got a better roster of fighters, that like small period in time where Pride was right there for me, I think is more exciting. Oh, one hundred percent. Like, what was the the Nick Diaz fight? That was just an absolute slugfest. Um. Not in Oki, is it? Don't know, mate. We have to Google this now. Um, I, was, I, was, I ended up watching that a while back. I was just sort of like, you don't get those fights anymore. Like, I'm not seeing a... Takanori Gomi, that's the one. Pride 33. Because like, I liked the, the first round in Pride. It was a 10-minute round, wasn't it? Yeah. And then sort of went on from there. But you don't really get your sort of Clay Guida versus Diego Sanchez style <laughs> fights anymore, do you? Yeah, that's the one that was springing to my mind then. Yeah. Um, or is it... What, I can't remember the name of the, the Japanese fighter, but the one with Don Fry where they essentially click, uh, clinching and punching oh, each other. Yeah, that was UFC... No, it was, a pride, it was a pride match. That Was one. it? Yeah, they got, the, they got those blue pride gloves on. Ah, uh, let me see if I can find that one. Don Fry. Don Fry versus Shamrock. Oh, Yoshiro Takeyama. Yeah. Like, I mean, you want to talk about insane fights, like two guys just choosing to clinch with each other and punch each other in the head till one falls down. The stare down, though, like... <laughs> There's a there's a video on YouTube for it, and they just stood in the pocket, just punching and punch like the guy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if we can. Uh, I'd recommend anybody going to watch this because the guy's face after the fight as well is just a sight. Like he, his face is swollen, like he, his lips like he's been to like a clinic and had his lip and he had, had fillers in. There are as well. We can maybe talk about this a little bit after if you're going to show a little clip on this. But one of my favourite fighters of all time, and that ridiculousness has just reminded me of one of the one of the fun matches to watch is Genki Sudo. Fucking love Genki Sudo. Have you seen you him fight? But watched him recently for a while. You know, <laughs> he's got like the best entrances in all of MMA, um, and he's just like fucking sick grappler. I'm after. I'm gonna. You're gonna have to, I'm gonna be going back through through all these. Um, Old fights now. We'll have to do the first one that come up was the Butterbean fight. Yeah, that's the one, that's the one that he was just popping into my head when I was thinking about that Don Fry one. The heel hooks, he finishes in with a heel hook, I think, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. But he's one person that I would not try to get underneath. Butterbean? Yeah. Yeah. Because you'll get a submission from him just laying you. I mean, that kind of reminds me of watching the Hicks and Gracie choke documentary. Um, where the guy who's getting getting his fucking face pounded in basically just heel hooks everybody all the way up until the the final. Where yeah, it just looks like he's been in a car crash. Like, yeah, there's, you just you don't get the same level of hunger, I'd say. And also, as well, you don't get those ridiculous um, matchups where it's like two guys who shouldn't be fighting. You know, like those no weight category. Matches, yeah. Um, they're, they're they're a bit of a freak show. I mean, like, well, we were talking about it the other week actually. Gabby Garcia. Uh, mm. I mean, that's a that's an absolute oddity of a situation nowadays. But that was fairly commonplace back in the day in Japan, wasn't it? Oh yeah, it was um, Bob Sap. Like they used to just put him in with plays the same size as like Genki Sudo. Yeah. And I remember see I I can't don't know the fight, but I remember seeing a clip of him bear hugging somebody. And just going bonk on top of the head with his fists. 
I, he literally tombstones somebody in a match. Yeah. Like Undertaker style, upside down, tombstone. How is that allowed? I did, what, it, what it, was, it, it wasn't it wasn't in the rules to not do it. <laughs> he was probably encouraged to do it, mate. Um, like he had a huge like I, I did a bit of reading on him years ago, and apparently, like the 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 fandom behind him in Japan was ridiculous. Yeah, like okay, they'd, superhero, they'd sell yeah. masks of his face, like like there's no tomorrow. He had a huge, like I think he was on cereal boxes and everything. He had a huge following in Japan. It's a big fucking cereal box. <laughs> <laughs> what were they called Jusos <laughs> and so talking about Bob Sat reminds me of one of my favourite um, strikers of all time Ernesto Hoost I used to love watching Ernesto Hoost fight mm. um, He's, I'm, not familiar, I'm not too familiar with him to be honest man, go you'll, have to, you'll have to educate me go, go and watch some of Ernesto Hoost fights it's super exciting kickboxer um, and he, has, he does have a match with Bob Sapp uh, but it's all those like glory days of pride, just super awesome fights, super aggressive. I'll have to got all load of new tabs up now on me uh on me on my laptop. This, this might be this should this might have to be a separate uh podcast where we just take a deep dive back into some of the old K1 days, yeah, or some of the old pride days and talk about all fights. I um, think that's gonna have to be done that like we'll have to We'll have to do like a bit of a uh, recap of them as well because I'm gonna I'll probably spend the weekend now watching fights. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll uh, stick up a poll on the Instagram for people to send in their favourite uh, K1 or Pride match for us to review. Mm-hmm. Um, and if Ernesto Hoost isn't on any of those lists, I'm gonna I'm just gonna vet <laughs> it and stick one in. Um, yeah, like because there was like M1 Global like. Uh, there was just there's been so many great organisations like Dream as well like that disappeared now, hasn't it? Yeah. Remember Affliction, Donald Trump's um, fight organisation. Just uh, remember the t-shirts. The the size of the ring was ma- like I'm talking huge. The ring, like basketball like, court sized. Joe Rogan. Yeah, Joe like pretty much. They had um, it was a fight that it was Alosky versus Fedor. And the ring made them look like lightweights. So you um, one ring, if we're going to call it that, that like does actually look quite interesting. Is have you seen the combat karate? It's like a pit. Have you seen it? No. Google that. It's like um, it, it'd be good for spectating, but you'd have to get the camera angles right because there'd be no cages up. It's just basically in. Uh, pit where the where the walls are slightly sloped on like a 45 degree angle so there's still an element of being able to use the wall or the cage in there but uh, I think there's no size is it similar it. to the one that was in Bloodsport very much so yeah ah uh, yeah I can see it that, that, you know, that'd be a really good ring actually yeah stops that people would be quite interesting. falling out of the ring like used to happen in uh, boxing matches or kickboxing mm. um, you can still use an element of the cage like I reckon it completely well it completely changed the way stand-up's done and the clinching on yeah. the cage um, yeah the, the the image that I found here it just looks like an underground fight club yeah I mean, it look, looks com- decent that combat karate is a bit crap like the level of the striking is not the best oh is it uh, uh, but and Basarutan does some of the commentary on it uh, so it's pretty cool but it's um, I think if you stuck MMA or more grappling based sport in that that'd be that'd be a little bit more exciting and, and yeah. maybe a different take on the way to use the arena you definitely get like a lot more of the um, who was it that knocked out uh, Benton Henderson with a flying kick uh, showtime yeah you, you'll get like a lot more of those style knockouts I think with the with this I might even bring back the Superman punch. Yeah, you could do a bit of parkour off the walls, couldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. That looks interesting. I've got a few uh, different tabs up here now. Well, there you go. Then I think we've got a bit of research to do and then we can come back in strong on the 
on the next podcast. Yeah, like I'm just trying to find this affliction ring as well now. That's the one. Yeah, but if you've not seen the Arlovski versus um, Emilian Ankle fight as well, uh, that's one of my favourite knockouts. Have you, have you seen that one? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna Google the the ring. Um... It's, it's quite big, isn't it? Mm. Unusual. It like it makes them look tiny in it as well. Yeah, Fedor's quality. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. But uh, yeah, make sure you hit us up on all the socials at the Grapplers Academy. If you enjoyed today's talk as well about like different organisations and different old old school fights, drop us a message and let us know any fights that, you, that we missed out on that we should have mentioned. Yeah, because I uh, think we'll uh, stick a poll up and uh, see see what ones we should review. Get get yeah. the popular vote on it. Uh, we're yeah, we're quite open to suggestions on that as well. Um, if you're still sticking with us all the way through these ramblings, well done. And thank you. And if you haven't subscribed already and you're still listening to this point, what's wrong with you? <laughs> um, if you don't like listening to how we like to talk about strong guys beating up small people at the beginning of the podcast and then completely divert onto all K1 fights at the end of it, then this is pretty much the general thing for every one of these open discussion podcasts. So stick around for more. <laughs> Definitely. And yeah, drop us a comment, drop us a like, give us a thumbs up on... Um, on the YouTube as well. I say it all helps us and make sure you go back and check out some of our old technique videos as well. Like we are resharing those since we're unable to film together at the moment. Um but like I say there's plenty and plenty of great stuff to go look go back and look on. Um at the Grappers Academy on YouTube, Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, Instagram, Facebook, got Bonafide PT, uh coached by Sai. And we'll see you next week. Bye.